would like to introduce the moderator of this panel, Colonel Bob Patrick, United States Army, retired. Uh, Bob is the former director of the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Also was the director at the dedication of the World War II Memorial in 2004. I'd now like to turn the panel over to Bob. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The history of World War II continues to be a source of amazing stories of those who lived and served during that time. Today, we have four members of the greatest generation with amazing accounts of valor, determination, suffering, and steadfastness. Each brings a different perspective of events that occurred during what's called the war. Colonel Frank Cohn, on your left, was born in Germany. As a young Jewish boy, he encountered the beginning of Nazi persecution. His family escaped to the United States in 1943. Frank was drafted in, uh, Frank was drafted in the Army in 1943. He returned to Europe and served in Army intelligence and eventually served with the United States Army through Vietnam. Next to Frank is Manny Mandel, also born in Germany. And as a young Jewish boy, he too suffered under Nazi persecution. He has the story of having his family captured by the Nazis and being used as barter for Allied war material. He was imprisoned at Bergen-Belsen and eventually made it to the United States. Next to Manny, Eleanor Otto is one of the last of what we've come to know as Rosie the Riveter. She began working in 1942 at the age of 20 at an airplane assembly plant in California and continued working in airplane, pa airplane pants, plants to the age of 95. You do the math on that, okay? <laughs> and finally, we have Dave Yoho, who served with the U.S. Maritime Service. He, too, enlisted at a very young age and worked in the boiler room of a tanker. I have a lot more to talk about Dave in a little bit, but he brings the message of an oft-overlooked story of World War II, and that is that of the Merchant Mariner. Eleanor, I'd like to start with you. Could you please tell me why you s signed on to work as an airplane uh, worker, plant worker, in 1942? Well, it was exciting to hear about us working uh, with men's jobs, which we was never able to before, and help win the war. That was important. How were you winning the war? We helped it. We helped build the airplanes. What, would you, what were you doing on the airplanes? What was your riveting, job? Drilling, riveting, putting them together really? in all sections. Yes. And, and you and how many women were there? How, were, were you all of Many you? women. Many, many women came, yes, to replace the men. Yeah. And, and why do you think so many women signed up to do that? Because it was a challenge, something different for us, and exciting to think that we were going to be part of winning the war and working hard to do it and, you know. There were probably still a few of the men workers around at that time. Uh, how were you accepted? Right away. They, they took us women, yes. They had to have replacements for the men, you know, like you. <laughs> 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 well, uh, what kind of airplanes and equipment were you working on? Do you recall what the... I was working on big parts at the time and we don't know what kind of airplane they went on. There was many of the war planes, but uh, they didn't tell us because the schedules were high. You had to get busy and they didn't train us for anything. It was on the job training mm -hmm. with lead men. And uh, how long did you have to work every day? How long was your day? Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Yeah. And sometimes on weekend, if, if necessary, if tried to get the one certain plane out. Oh. Um. Every day of the week or five days a week it was this? Five days a week? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, so the war was over in 1945. What happened then? They say goodbye to us. <laughs> 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 but we were proud and we didn't uh, object men coming back to get their jobs. We were so proud of those men coming back to work. And we prayed for the ones that didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And so we went about our business doing other things. 
And nobody said we were rosy, or we did this, or we did that. Nobody said that. We didn't think we was important until this generation spoke up. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you see yourself as kind of a pioneer for women? And huh? Do you see yourself as kind of a pioneer for women and kind of yes, open doors? Yes, they, they, they all tell us we paved the way for them. Even the little girl that just drove us over here, I said, you know, she wouldn't have been driving that car to drive us around, a, a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. She's a chauffeur. We didn't have chauffeurs in those days. Women, not women. <laughs> um, you went on to work in, in airplane plants after the war, after... Yes. I did other things between times, but then I went back to work in 1951 uh, at Ryan Aeronautical that built a Spirit of St. Louis for Lindbergh. And those three guys that did it were still there. And I met them. And that was exciting. So and I was there 14 years. And then they stopped building airplanes, so laid us off. And I was off for about 10 months. And then they called us. They said, if you want a job, you better get back to Long Beach, because they're hire Douglas is hiring for the first time since the war, hiring women. Mm -hmm. How long did you work for Douglas? Um, it would have been 50 years if I'd stayed another six months, but when they start closing the plant down and laying people off, they didn't go by seniority. They went by departments. You're doing the math on this? 50 years at Douglas Air Force. And when did you retire from Douglas? I never retired. I was laid off. You were laid <laughs> off. <laughs> I wouldn't retire. Is, is your resume still out there? <laughs> Well, let me, in, let me let you in on another secret. On Monday, October the 28th, 2019, how old will you be? I will be 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Colonel Frank Cohn. Frank, uh, as I mentioned, would you please talk about your early days in Germany and how you got to America and, and eventually enlisted in the Army? Well, you know, uh, I was born in 1925, and that was uh, right after a very big inflation that wiped out the entire middle class as far as money was concerned. A loaf of bread was, a hundred, uh, was over uh, a million marks. Uh, and Obviously, nobody had that kind of money. Anyway, uh, my parents uh, started with a sporting goods store, and by 1933, they had a pretty good going uh, operation. But as Hitler came to power, uh, there were demonstrators in front of the store, stormtroopers with signs, don't buy from Jews. And my father understood right away that this wasn't going to work. So he sold the store, and it, it was a calamity at that point, but it was one of the luckiest things because we had no anchor of staying in Germany. And things got from bad to worse as the years go by, and by 1938, I was 13 at that point, uh, he knew he could not support his family anymore. So he knew also that he had distant relatives in the States, and he would find them and get an affidavit. An affidavit is a document that assures that the person that it's issued to will not become a burden to the state. So the person who's issuing the affidavit has to have enough money. Well, he found his relatives, but they did not have the money because we had inflation at that time in the States, bad inflation and people just didn't have that type of money to uh, be able to support a whole family. So he had to stay longer, and that, again, was a catastrophe for him, but it was the luckiest thing in the world because when he stayed longer, uh, we had Gestapo agents come to our door looking, looking for him. So my mother uh, wrote him, uh, if you can, don't come back. <laughs> and now she turned to me, and said, well, should we go? And as a kid of 13, I had a lot of anchors there, 
Uh, I was on the soccer team in the forward line. I liked my position. Uh, I had just gotten a BMW bicycle, not a motorbike, a bicycle. And uh, I had a stamp collection, and I had a lot of friends. But the problem in Germany was such that you knew, even as a 13-year-old, you were not wanted there. There were signs in restaurants and such that said, Jews not desired, or uh, in a more crude restaurant, Jews forbidden. Anyway, uh, I knew that these people didn't want me, and I knew I was separate from them. And I told my mother, let's go. And she got a visitor's visa for herself and got the consulate to put my name on it. So I was on her passport. And we took off. And we ended in New York uh, on the 30th of October, 1938. And that was a very uh, date to remember for us. Because just 10 days later, November 9th, was the time uh, that there was uh, a pogrom against the Jews in Germany named Crystal Night. It was the place when they uh, broke, and that's why the name Crystal came in. They broke all the glasses that they could on businesses that were still in, in Jewish uh, uh, ownership. Uh, they uh, burned down the synagogues and smashed them, and they arrested uh, every male that they could get their hands on and put them in concentration camps. And that, of course, was a catastrophe for the Jews. But for us, it was our life saving because, in that respect, General, uh, rather, President Roosevelt issued an executive order that anyone in country would not be returned. We, who had a visitor's visa, were affected by that because they could no longer send us back, and that's how we were saved. You want to talk a little bit about entering the Army in 43? And well, Pearl Harbor came when I was 16, and I remember the kid coming up the street, uh, and it was cool, but it was December. Anyway, uh, he yelled, the Japs just attacked Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, what's Pearl Harbor? Nobody knew what Pearl Harbor was. We had to go to a map and find out, oh, it's Hawaii. Well, of course, 16 years old wasn't going to affect me. Ha, huh. it didn't take long <laughs> when I realized it was going to affect me. So I was 18 in August of 1943. In September, I was drafted. I was in the Army. Oh, wow. Uh, now, I spoke German, but somehow they never discovered this until I was in a replacement stream as an infantryman going uh, to Europe. And somewhere in England, somebody figured out I spoke German. Now, German speakers uh, were a, a big in big demand at those times, and they had a whole class of German speakers, people similar to me, refugees, who uh, had English as their first language, or they spoke English at home, and they put them into a six-month course in uh, Fort Ritchie, well, it was Camp Ritchie at the time, in Maryland. Six months, and they became uh, intelligence agents, where they don't re wear rank, but uh, US, US, uh, and nobody knew what rank they had. Anyway, these Ritchie boys were in, in Europe, of course. And here I came as an infantryman. And it took them until I got to Belgium all the way up to Malmedy to take me back to Le Vessonnet near Paris to give me a two-week course in intelligence. Well, I took, after I finished the first week, they needed me so badly. And they said, you have to go now. And I joined my team as a full-fledged intelligence agent with one week of training. That was <laughs> World War II. Anyway, I had a, a team of a captain, a lieutenant, a, a sergeant, a driver, and two interpreters. A staff sergeant, uh, my buddy Flo, and me, PFC Frank Cohn. And I served as a PFC all through the war because I was a low man on the totem pole. But I had US, US. I never had any PFC stripes on me, and nobody knew what my rank was. And when you go out, and what, what, what it was, we had dossiers as we got into Germany that had building targets and personality targets. 
personal targets were people to be uh, prosecuted under war crimes. Uh, and building targets was anything that was of use to the occupying force to include things for uh, uh, occupying. Anyway, that is how we went from one city to the next until we hit Magdeburg, which was at the Elbe. And if you know anything about World War II, the Elbe River was a delineation line uh, dictated by General Eisenhower at the time in order that the Soviet forces and the US forces would not intersect each other. We would stay on the west side of the Elbe, they would stay on the east side, and nobody was to cross. When I hit the Elbe, my captain had orders to cross to show the Russians the occupation zones so that they don't come across too early. They should wait about uh, three, four months before they would come across. Well, we had gotten to uh, Magdeburg uh, along the Autobahn, the major streets in, in Germany, and we knew the war was over because German soldiers came to the Autobahn trying to give up to us, and of course we had to wave them away, but we knew nobody was going to fire at us anymore. The war was over, and we got to, uh, to Magdeburg in that way. And he's looking for an interpreter in Russian uh, to help him when he goes across. Couldn't find one. He said, Cohn, you're my interpreter. I'm trying to get out of this thing because I knew I didn't speak any Russian. I knew one word, tovarish, friend. That's it. Anyway, <laughs> we, we got across, and you wouldn't believe the reception we received. They carried us around as if he and I had conquered all of Western Germany. Well, of course, it took me years later to find out why did we get such an exception, such a, such a reception when we arrived. And it was very simple. While we knew the war was over, they had to fight all the way to the Elbe, and they were celebrating their victory, their survival. They had uh, survived the war, and that's why we were received that way. Thank you, Frank. Manny, do you want to talk about your, your experience? Sure. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. We're sitting on the stage here with two gentlemen in their 90s, <clears throat> and the lady was beyond that. I'm the kid. I'm only 83. <laughs> Let me tell you a kid experience, which really is not directly Holocaust connected, but which is an experience that a five and a half year old had at that age. My mother and father are both ethnically Hungarians. My mother comes from southern Hungary, which you might know if you know some history and some geography as the former Yugoslavia. My father comes from eastern Hungary, which is called Transylvania, and you know one person who comes from Transylvania. Who's that? <laughs> My father said he never met him. <laughs> in the winter of 1941, we're living in Budapest, the war had not impacted us in any way, and even the Holocaust did not. certainly didn't impact a kid like I because of my age. There's some issues about employment and about professions and schools, but not a five and a half year old. My grandparents, my mother's parents lived south of Budapest on the Danube River, about three hours by train in what was then Yugoslavia. And they decided in December of 1941 to take a little trip for a week or so. I was not yet in school, just to visit with my grandparents. The city is called Novi Sad, which you may or may not know. That's not important. But we arrived there and we stayed with my, my, one of my mother's sisters. She had two sisters there. We stayed with the younger sister in her apartment. And it was an uneventful day or two, as I remember, although I remember my uncle taking me to his place of work, which is a cork factory. He had some kind of a handlebar mounted seat made on his bicycle, and he rode us out to the factory. I have no recollection of the factory except what it was. The third day, I think it was, in the morning about 7.30, somebody comes up the stairs or the elevator, I don't remember, and says there's something funky going on on the street. Okay. Five minutes later, knock, knock on the door, and two 
well-dressed and, in my recollection, polite police officers say, ladies and gentlemen, you need to dress warmly. You need to come outside. We need to run a census. Now, please understand the Nazis ran censuses, if there's such a word, every 20 minutes. I exaggerate. We do a census every 10 years. They did one with great frequency because it was a way to control the population and know where everybody was all the time. We go outside to the street. It was unusual to have a census at 7.30 in the morning, but it didn't seem like anything was dangerous. We told to dress warmly. It's winter time. It's not blizzardy, but there's snow on the ground. And we're outside in the street. We're told to line up on a sidewalk and turn left, which we did, start walking. Now, I know that we walked for some time, maybe a couple of hours. Nobody hassled us. We just walked. I walked. I'm five and a half years old. My father carried me. My mother carried me. And we arrived at a place which, believe it or not, I recognized. What there was is there was this eight-foot stockade fence, the sidewalk on which we were, and then kind of a main street on our right. And folks were going down the sidewalk towards the open gates of this stockade fence. I recognized the place because I'd been there probably the previous August, a couple months before. In European cities, for those of you who don't know, if you're not on a lake or the ocean, you make beaches out of rivers. And inside this fence, the Danube River flowed three or 400 yards away. And inside the fence in the summertime, there were wave pools and hot pools and cold pools and thermal pools and restaurants and amusement park. It was a lovely place. I'd been there, and I remembered that. Why we're there now, I don't quite know. And we're kind of walking along down towards these open gates. And some place before we get to the gates, there's a police officer standing on the right and says to my father, Mister, what are you doing here? My father was bewildered, but he said, well, I'm here visiting with my family. He said, well, that's fine. That's your business. But what are you doing here? You're not from here. That was correct. He said, if we count you in the census, because he believed there's a census going on, you're going to mess up the numbers. Step aside. <laughs> my father said to him, fine, I'm delighted to do that, but would you tell me how you know me? He says, well, I'm a street police officer a block from where you live in Budapest. I was brought down here for the census, and I've seen you on the streets dozens of times, going this way, going that way. So I knew that you didn't belong here. OK? We step aside. As we step aside, within minutes, as I remember, I'm five and a half years old, guys. Even for me, it's a long time ago. A staff car comes down the road. An officer gets out. I don't even know what officer was, a Hungarian, not German, maybe Yugoslav, gets on a bullhorn after he talks to his buddies, and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, the requirements of the census are gone, are done. Please go home. Nobody, and I mean nobody, not a five and a half year old, but the adults had no idea what happened. We went home, and they even said, look, there's a school down the street. You're welcome to go there for some coffee and some hot chocolate. My father grabbed the first taxi he could, and we went back to my aunt's house. As we get back to the house, the phone is ringing off the hook. My other aunt, my mother's other sister, is calling, saying, where were you all day? We had some plans. We tell her. She says, that's interesting. Somebody came to my door at 7.30 in the morning, said they have to run a census. They asked me four questions. I offered them a cup of coffee. They said, thank you, and they left. As the calls begin to come in, we begin to find out what took place. And that's the important message I want to give you. In the hinterlands of the neighborhood, in the forests around what not, some partisan activity took place. Do you know anything about partisan activities? If you don't, these were activities of small groups who in some way of their own volition attempted to in some way inflict some harm on the German massive movement. A truck, an assassination, a railroad car, railroad tracks, that kind of stuff. Something like that took place. So the leadership of, the, of that community, the command of the community, decided to run a pogrom. What was the pogrom? They got every Jew out of every house they could, and non-Jews as well, marched them down to the stockade fence, turned them in towards the river, which was several hundred yards to the left. Ice was three feet thick, but they had opened that ice up with cannon fire that morning and shot the people into the river. Several hundred people. Several hundred people were shot, never to be found, or to be found when the river was thinner down the river, down towards Belgrade, or when spring came in March or something like that. But what I'm trying to say to you 
is that this is an experience that a kid recalls. This is not directly Holocaust connected, but it's a recollection of a kid who, under, who remembers precisely what took place, had no idea why this took place, and of course it took years for me to begin to understand why do people get marched and shot. But this is a pogrom. And having told you this, now you have a kind of a personal experience through my experience in what a pogrom looked like. Thank you, Manny. Our next speaker would be Dave Yoho. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background of Dave's service. Uh, Dave served in the US Maritime Service. And if you don't know what that is, it's, it's more commonly called a merchant marine. Uh, he enlisted before he was 16 years old, of, of, of some 250,000 who went to the Merchant Marine in World War II. Um, in case you don't know, the Merchant Marine had a very high casualty rate. Of all the services in World War II, probably had the highest casualty rate per, uh, per 1,000 people. Uh, one in 26 died who were in the uh, Merchant Marine. Um, Dave uh, served on board a tanker ship designed to refuel ships and did a lot of that in the Pacific. Um, and since the end of the war, uh, Dave has been uh, an active advocate for not just the Merchant Marine, but veterans in general. He's made speeches all over the country, uh, been on television with the Today Show, the Tonight Show, uh, been to the White House three times. But he comes here today with a message, and it's a message that he would like to share with each and every one of you here in the auditorium. Dave? Thank you. First of all, <coughs> this is about you. It's not about me. So I salute you, because consciously or unconsciously, you have made the same decision that I made and that the rest of us made, that this is a great country. And it is a country that has lived through changes <laughs> that you may never experience, I hope. And I am going to try to generate through what I'm going to say to you today a little bit of my history but the things that you may not have learned in your curricula, in your high school, and in your colleges. World War II, December 7, 1941, I was 13. Our country was attached. Our country was attacked by a foreign government we knew nothing about. On December the 8th, you had to stand in lines that were 50 and 75 and 100 feet long of young men volunteering to go and serve this country. We had 130 million people in the United States. We put 16 million in uniform. We fought in five continents throughout the world. And we fought by making a decision somewhat similar to the decision you made. We raised our hands and we said, I swear that I will serve my country. I swear I will serve my flag. And you live in a contemporary society which says it is maybe not in your sight, but somebody's sight, it's okay not to serve that flag, not to stand when our national anthem. But those people who enlisted that next day, they had no recriminations about what they were going to do and what they were going to face. And I proudly say I'm one of them. 1944. I, on a falsified birth certificate, I was, I was born in the inner city of Philadelphia. Don't raise your hand and applaud because it ain't all that great. <laughs> I was 15 years of age. I did well in school. I skipped two grades, but I had some problems with my, the maintaining of my dignity in the school system. I didn't like it, didn't understand it. And I came from a poor inner city family. My mother had about an eighth grade education. My father, maybe ninth or 10th grade. We never owned a house, never owned a car. Never mind about television. It wasn't even invented by that time. But I went away into instant maturation. And those you meet in the military at any given time, and the contemporary wisdom says, shake their hands and say, thank you for the service. Wonderful. Say to your professor, Thank you for the limited history you have given me. In that Pacific area, 1933, the rape of Nanking started World War II in the Pacific. The rape of Nanking, look it up. Men, women, and children slaughtered. You want to go back in history here? Here's the history of why we got involved in Germany. 
But those countries were at war long before we came on the scene because we did not declare war on Germany. Germany declared war on us because of a pact with the Japanese and the Russians and uh, the Italians that if anyone was invaded or anyone went to war, we would support those people. Those rules, those laws, which made it possible for the Holocaust were invented by people. I love my country. I pledge the flag. I stand when appropriate. I sing the Star Spangled Banner because I know the words. And I take off my hat and put my hand over my heart and thank God that I was born in this country. I don't like the way it's run. And if you want to know about the history, study the history of Korea. What we as a country did to the Korean veterans was sad. You're going to meet some of them later on today or tomorrow. What we did to the Vietnamese veterans, it, it isn't even honorable. But we did it. No, collectively we did it as a country because people make the laws and say what you will do or what you won't do. And those same people later go, oh, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have done it that way. In the meantime, you see a veteran come home. Do you know what we did as a society to these Korean and Vietnamese rested? Tomorrow or later today, you'll hear from uh, General Steve Ritchie, a close personal friend of mine, the air ace of Vietnam, five, five kills. They don't fight sorties like that anymore, five kills. And when he came home, and held in high esteem, and holding the American flag, they threw eggs at him. But see, you have decided that you are going to take that same mantle. And I will not stand consciously in any place where someone desecrates my flag or refuses to stand. I have no time for that because we, all of us, at one time in our life raised our right hand and took an oath that we would serve our country, defend our country, and you will face times in your life where you're criticized. Let me interweave here. I joined the United States Maritime Service. It doesn't even exist in peacetime. First created by President Roosevelt in 1938. He anticipated if we went to war, we'd have to have merchant ships. So they're going to build merchant ships. They, bought, they built something called a liberty ship. But now they had to find people to put on those ships. And so they recruited 250,000 of us. There are only three training bases in the United States and one great officer's training. And then they put you on a ship. And I got on a ship here. I came from Franklin Street in Philadelphia. The closest I ever got to a boiler was going down to my parents' house and taking the ashes out. And they're going to put me on a ship. A big expensive ship made by my government, paid for by the taxpayers. I was 16 years of age. How many of you are 16 now? God bless you, we think we know everything. <laughs> and I was sure of it. I knew a lot about the streets. I was stabbed twice before I was old enough to drive a car. They put me in an engine room. They taught me how to manage the fires that burn into the boilers that give you the steam that drives 15, 16 years of age. I didn't do a good job either. <laughs> but you see, we were all they had. Why would a government, why would a government have to put someone in 16, 17, 18 in uniform? Because we had 130 million people, 12.5% of our population was dedicated to preserving what our forebears told us this country can be. And you and I have had educations. I have an undergraduate degree from Temple University. Although I'm an advocate, I understand some people are here, I am Penn State. <laughs> Let me take it a step further. Uh, when I came home, I came home to a country that had a lot of problems. We had a, uh, we, we had a, a, what would you might call a recession. And the recession came about because all of these millions of veterans were coming home. And we were going to come home to joy. Now, 
we had to come home with something that nobody wanted to talk about. So search your history for this. Look what post-traumatic stress is. I got it. Malaria. I have it. Now, in addition to all of that, I was treated for ulcers before I was 18 years of age, only to find out that it wasn't ulcers. It was another disease. Do I regret any of it? No, I don't regret a damn thing. I knew that this country was great. My parents never owned a home, but from that environment, wherever you come from, you remember this too. You are given the opportunity to live in the United States of America, and hands down, it is the greatest country in the world. Nothing comes close to it, nothing. I've traveled all over the world, spoken in 22 foreign countries, observed everything, been in the White House three times on all the Today shows. I'm gonna tell you, nothing, nothing changes what we know. What a strange things happen. And Roger Kipling said it in a poem about the British soldier, he called him a Tommy. And he said, it's Tommy this, and Tommy that, and Tommy, go away. You see, some of your peer groups will ridicule you for your interest in our military. Some of your peer groups may ridicule, uh, ridicule you for your patriotism and what you think and feel about this great country. And take it. So the Merchant Marine, we were put on merchant ships and treated as civilians. Unbelievable. We lost 1,500 ships. We lost one out of every 26 of us who recruited, we were recruited, one of 26. A 1,000 came home with an undistinguished disease or something wrong with their, their ability to walk or talk. 680 of us were in prison camps from the time we were captured. You're going to have an opportunity if you're in, how many of you are in college now? You're good readers. Let me give you an example. Find out about something called the Murmansk Run. That's my war. You look at the World War II Memorial, the Murmansk Run. There was one convoy. They started in Halifax, Nova Scotia, came down the coast and went over and went into a place called Murmansk or Archangel. Coldest water in the world, near the Bering Straits. Big caution because we're near Norway. In Norway, they had the, the, uh, the Nazis, the Germans, had their fleet. Had a battleship there called the Tirpitz, T-I-R-P-I-T-Z. Second greatest battleship in the world ever built. And they were concerned about it. So they sent these 39 ships from the United States of America into this area of Murmansk with military escort. So we had destroyers. We had destroyer escorts. We had submarines. We had aircraft. We had all those things that took us there. And then there was an admiral in, in uh, England who was in charge of that theater war, and he decided, because of some unknown factor, to pull away, to pull all the support. Now, on our ships, I was on a ship. I wasn't on a ship there. The ships were armed, these uh, uh, ships I talked to you about. They have a 5-inch 38 on their aft or in their bow, uh, on their aft. And in the front part of the ship, they have a 3-inch 50. And then, beyond that, there are eight 50 caliber machine guns. But those ships went in when all of this was withdrawn. 39 ships, 11, 11 count them, 11 made it. It's water temperatures, 45 below zero. You hit that water, you got four minutes to live before it sets into your bones and your skins and you can't even move. It's called hypothermia. Talk about that. December 2nd, 1943, Bari, Italy. The second worst medical, the first the naval disaster in the world happened in Bari, where we had a ship. There were 30 ships, bumper to bumper, nose to nose, in an Adriatic port. That's in Bari, Italy, is an Adriatic port. 
And one ship with cargo ordered by Montgomery, a British general, had 100 tons of mustard bombs. Did you hear it taught at your school level? And when that ship was hit with a bomb, it was disintegrated. So I bring to you your history. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I salute here my contemporaries, my brothers, my sister. Thanks for the kiss, baby. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes for questions, only a couple, but the microphones are here in the aisle. If anyone would like to ask a quick, quick question, please go down to the microphone here. I see some movement up there. Go right ahead. Speak up. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, ma'am. Uh, Michigan First Class Falk from UMBC Naval ROTC. Um, sir, this is for uh, David Yoho. What metric do you base your judgment of greatest country? Um, I mean, we're not. I mean, for a lot of reasons, we're no longer first um, as in terms of academics, finance, etc. And there, uh, like you said, there are definitely some issues with how the country is run. So, how do you feel, besides pride, that our country is the greatest? What what grade of college are you in? I'm sorry. What what year of college are you in? I'm a senior, sir. Yeah. You asked me three questions in one, but that's okay. It's called <laughs> binary, but I'll try to answer. I based it on my personal experience. I came out of that city and uh, instant maturation. I lived in a world that you may never understand. At 15, 16 years of age, I did what people a lot older than me did and got in a lot of trouble for some of it. But this country fought on five continents and we lost 440,000, and we gave this country's riches to others. And I saw that because I grew up in the Depression. 1928, I was born, 1928, 1929, the stock market uh, ended. 1933, the banks failed. 1935, I lived in a rented house where my father and mother paid $11 a month if the landlord could catch it when you had money in your pocket. <laughs> And they offered us that house when the man died. It was $850. But you needed $200 as a deposit and $25 for closing. If that's not enough of the story, I got 40 more. But that answers the question. I feel, I think, I believe because I lived through it. And I lived on a remote area of what these gentlemen talk about, the Holocaust. And I never want to see it happen again. I hope that answered your question, at least two parts of it. It did, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for all our panelists. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>